most people have heard about Good King Wenceslas looking out on the Feast of Stephen, but who was he, what was so good about him, and why do we still remember him today? Much of the historical literature about him is written in German or Czech, which probably explains why his German Wikipedia page is about three times as long as the English one. Unfortunately, I don't speak German or Czech, but enough has been written by historians about him in English to understand who he was and why he was so important. Wenceslas I, or Václav the Good in his native country, was the Duke of Bohemia until his assassination by his brother Boleslaus the Cruel, although with a name like that he probably should have seen it coming. He was part of the Przemyslid dynasty, who first showed up in 872 AD under the name of Bozovoj Przemyslid, who supposedly became the first Duke of Bohemia. I say supposedly because much of the origins of the Przemyslid dynasty are shrouded in legend. Some writers have even claimed Bozovoj himself to have been an entirely legendary figure, although more recently historians seem to edge more towards his actually having existed and played the historical role the account set him. Anyway, Bozovoj had united the other local rulers under him, suppressed the power of the assembly that had ruled before him, ensured the ducal throne would pass on through his line, began the ensurfment of the population, forced the extraction of a variety of Jews from villagers, and converted to Christianity. A really top guy. He also married a woman called Ludmilla, who converted to Christianity with him and with whom he had two sons, Spitanev and Ratislav. When Bozovoj died, the throne passed on to his son, Spitanev, who died childless, passing the throne to his younger brother, Bratislav, who in turn, in 921 AD, passed it on to his child, Wenceslas. Let's pause here to look at what Wenceslas was inheriting. The Przemyslid dynasty's power base had been well set up by Wenceslas's predecessors. The dynasty's seat of power was the castle of Prague, around which circled a number of frontier forts at a distance of between 26 to 34 kilometres. These forts were usually presided over by members of the Przemyslid lineage who did not hold the ducal throne itself, giving the dynasty a huge monopoly on power in Bohemia. In addition, the dukedom was relatively protected from threats outside itself by the mountains which surrounded it. And it was into this reasonably favourable position that Wenceslas, Bozovoj's grandson, was crowned duke in 921 AD. Now, Wenceslas was young, probably about 13 or 14, having been born in 907 or 908 AD. He needed a regent, and his mother, Jahumira, was there to fill that role, whilst his grandmother, Ludmilla, sought his education. Here, the sources differ. In one explanation, Wenceslas's mother, Jahumira, was a pagan, and his grandmother, Ludmilla, who, as you might recall, converted to Christianity alongside her husband, was a particularly zealous Christian. This resulted in a conflict between Jahumira and Ludmilla, as Jahumira seemed to believe that her authority over Wenceslas was being undermined and that he was being corrupted by priests. So, Jahumira simply had Ludmilla assassinated at her castle in Tetin. For his evil mother, who was mistakenly named Jahumira, took counsel with impious men and said, what shall we do about this matter, since he who is to become prince has been led astray by clerics and by my mother-in-law and is like a monk? I shall destroy her and drive the others from the land, and immediately she sent her counsellors and had her mother-in-law, Ludmilla, strangled. And after this, there was a general banishment of clerics, and churches were destroyed throughout the land of Bohemia. Ludmilla would eventually come to be known as Bohemia's first Christian martyr. Jahamira's actions may not have sat well with Wenceslas, as when he ascended the throne in 925 AD, multiple sources state that he banished his mother, had the relics of his grandmother brought to Prague, and recalled the priests who his mother had driven from the land. But then, Another earlier source says nothing about Ludmilla's assassination, and states that Evil dogs! Formerly they had counselled Wenceslas to banish his mother without cause, but understanding the fear of God, Wenceslas feared the words that say, Honour thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Then, wishing to fulfil God's truth in all things, he recalled his mother, repented earnestly, and in tears said, O Lord God, lay not this sin to my charge. Regardless, Wenceslas began to reign in 925 AD, and he seems to have accepted the rule of the Saxon king, turning Bohemia into a vassal state because he believed that the head of the empire was the head of all Christian rulers by right. This act of humble piety may result in you being unsurprised to learn that Wenceslas was holy, saintly even. Take this account from the first Slavonic life of Saint Wenceslas, probably written before 940 AD. And verily, with the grace of God, Prince Wenceslas not only mastered letters, but he was perfected by faith. According to the words of the Gospel, he rendered good unto all the poor, clothed the naked, fed the hungry, and received wayfarers. He defended widows, had mercy on the people, the wanting and the wealthy, served those who worked for God, and adorned many churches with gold. 
for he believed in God with all his heart, and he did as much as he could, all manner of good things in his life. But there was a problem. As the scholar Marvin Cantor says, Indeed, what emerges from the pages of the lives is the picture of a man under the thumb of priests, retiring, neglectful of, and perhaps even insensible to the affairs of government. Christianity had not eliminated the necessity for a strong leader. Wenceslas appears to have lacked this important dimension. Left to his own devices, he would have preferred to become a monk and withdraw to a monastery. We do not know why, perhaps it is because of Wenceslas's weakness as a leader or his willingness to hand over Bohemia's independence, but Wenceslas's brother, Bolslav, lured Wenceslas to his residence at Stara Bolslav under the pretext of celebrating the consecration of a new church, and there he murdered him. Wenceslas became a saint almost immediately. He was invoked as a consoler, healer, and liberator, and became the protector of Czech armies. Eventually, John Mason Neal wrote the Christmas carol Good King Wenceslas in the mid-19th century, celebrating Wenceslas for his virtues and securing his place in the memories of the English-speaking world. Meanwhile, his brother Bolslav the Cruel is all but forgotten to us now. Yet, he reigned for another 50 years, and he reigned well. First, he repented for his role in the murder of his brother, doing nothing to attempt to stop his dead brother from becoming a saint. Then, he brought Bohemia closer to political autonomy, safeguarded its culture, and gave it a chance to develop economically. He soon brought Moravia, Slovakia, Silesia, and Krakow under his control, spread Christianity throughout his lands, and began negotiations to found a bishopric in Prague, which would eventually come into being a couple of years after the end of his reign. He enjoyed good relations with the Empire and the Pope, and when he finally died in 972, he passed the throne securely on to his son, Bolslav II, without issue. In the end, it is Bolslav, not Wenceslas, who we can say left behind a Bohemia which was much stronger than he'd found it. If you enjoyed this video, remember to subscribe for future content. A big shout out to my patrons, whose support helps me produce higher quality content. If you'd like to join them in supporting the channel, check out my Patreon in the description of the video, as well as some of the sources used to make the video. I'll see you next time.